Okay, and we are back from that break. Hello, everyone. This is lesson two now. On the is.800.d, this is the new updated course. <clears throat> we're still we're still learning how to use this, <laughs> but it's so much fun. I also have another channel up. It's called C19 First Responder Gamer because COVID-19 over all our Almost every single acti activity which we do, stars, is temporarily suspended. Um, that, that, that's our star tech team. Um, the only one which is totally active is our Amber Response Unit. That is still very active. It's called Code Amber. Um, anytime there's the Amber Response, we go after it. Um, we try find the vehicle in question. We mem I, I basically know the makes miles and years of vehicles for over 100 for over 100 vehicles so far it gets frustrating when it comes down to amber because sometimes you have a lot of high, high traffic and it's hard to spot a vehicle and the state of florida it's even harder because there are no front license plates if they have front license plates in the state of florida it will be much easier to find a vehicle Front light space should be mandatory throughout all 50 states. I do not like having just a back only because you need front face because a lot of the um, Amber Alerts have ha the same identical car and it's hard to find. Okay, you have 2,000 makes and models and then you have another, what, 1,000 vehicles the same exact color. That makes hunting them impossible. But... <laughs> <laughs> I hate out. Yeah, it's also allergy season, so take whatever you take the most. Um, I I like taking. I give a huge shout out to the makers of Claritin. You guys have an awesome product. Remember, when it comes out Claritin, take ev take one every twenty four hours. Cause remember, majority of medication have Tylenol in it. Keratin is one of those which have Tylenol in it. So always read the ingredients where it comes out to medication because sometimes you can get an overdose of Tylenol and it's very bad for the health if you have an overdose of Tylenol. So be very careful of those Tylenol-based products. Um, I always say this. All people need to take vitamin C, D12, B12, D3, omega-3, fish oil, which has omega, which is packed with omega-3, um, zinc, biotin, and biotin, which I, and our license, and that helps out, and that will help you out a lot when it comes down to our internal health. Um, I, t I love taking lots of mega vitamins. So my favorites are Biofusion, which is really, really good. I love Biofusion. Um, I love my, I definitely love a huge Zycam. I love my Zycam. I love, I love Nature's Bounty hair skin and nails gummies with biotin and collagen. Um, can you see D3 fish oil? And get the gummies. Gummies are much better than pills. The reason why? You're more apt to take them in a gummy form than in a pill version. Pills, I hate swallowing pills. Oh, I hate pills. But other than that, let's get down to the course because now it's 6.15. I want to get this done as fast as possible. So, now you got now with 800.d, lesson 2, the roles and responsibilities. Lesson provides an overview of the roles and responsibilities of key partners across the whole community who implement the National Response Framework. This includes important roles 
fraud of the government as well as the private sector, non governmental organizations, and the individuals families and households. A dead lesson you will be able to describe the response and roles and responsibilities of all elements of the whole community. And after this, I am going to be going in as C19, first responder gamer on another YouTube channel. So at the very end of, of this, um, I am going to do some video gaming at C19, first responder gamer. So let's do whole community involvement and subscribe to C19, first responder gamer channel. Um, at the at, at the end of this course, uh, we did we did like right now over half, just under half the course. I'm just going to go right through as fast as I can, give a few stories if if it involves it about what I what emergency response team did in the past 25 years, which involves the natural response framework. So. Let's get to it. Response partnerships. An effective, unified national response requires their mutual, mutually supporting capabilities, individuals and communities, the private and non profit sectors, faith based organizations, and all levels of government to understand their respective roles and responsibilities and how to complement each other in achieving shared goals. The video has provided more information on effective response partnerships.
communities, communities or groups that share goals, values, institutions, but are not always bound by geographic boundaries or political divisions. They may be private sector, individuals and families, health and medical, NGOs, faith-based organizations, neighborhood partnerships, advocacy groups, academia, and social community groups, associations. Communities provide opportunities for sharing information and promoting collective action. Engage these communities and preparedness efforts is important to identifying their needs and taking advantage of their potential contributions. Contri contributions. Um, you can learn more strategies and community preparedness by completing IS Independent Study 909 Community Preparedness Implementation. Implementing simple activities for everyone. So it's a really good course. It, uh, it's also designated for children too. That's why they allow children 10 and older to do um, the, the female independent study courses. Best thing about it, anybody's over 10 years old. By the time if they do all the courses here in FEMA, they do all of them. Hit 61 college credits. They can probably get the 61 college credits. I did I did all the FEMA courses along with my wife Caroline in under three months. Thanks for thanks to COVID, it took us three months to do it. Actually, what was it? Four months? What was it? April we finished. Yeah. Started in January and, and and we ended in April. Uh, yeah, just under four months. Uh, with COVID-19, children age 10 and older can actually probably have them done in probably like, I, I, I say probably four or five, even six months. You're, you're, you're stuck, you're, you're basically self-quarantined in your house. These courses will keep you focused and do these courses. So, talking about communities, we are a community. Anybody who's an independent study is a community because communities are not bounded by a geographic area or political, as I said. So you're, you're, with that about, with that mindset, this YouTube channel, Emergency Operation, Emergency Rapid Response Team, ERT channel, is a community. We are a community. We are like-minded individuals for one thing, saving lives, protecting property, and protecting the environment. The good thing I like about FEMA, they don't talk about global warming or climate change. They hardly ever talk about it. They're talking about protecting the environment in general. We got to protect it. Uh, we got to protect property too during disaster. We got to we, we have we have to protect ourselves so now you know this is a community anybody who's on a YouTube channel that is a community we're a community itself we should call ourselves the C19 gamers <laughs> and I want to give a huge shout out to one to our friends from geeks and gamers um, geeks and gamers we're a community we're all geeks we're all gamers um, Anybody in FEMA, we're a community. I'm a 501c3, we're a community. Um, I'm a 501c3, you're emergency management. But we have the same goals and agendas. Of course, you like copying my goals and agendas, but I but I, I do not mind at all. I could sue you for trademark infringements. I don't, have to, I don't have the stuff you have, but I'm not. Why? Because we are a community. We, anybody, just put it this way, lawsuits are fruitless if Privileged lawsuits, straight with me done. So, enough about privileged lawsuits. So, let's go to 44. Um, community involvement example, a core advisory group consists of people with cross disabilities who advise emergency managers about accessibilities. During a 2015 disaster response to a U.S. territory, there was no pre existing CAG. Core advisory group. 
Respires had to learn what sign languages were used, how many sign language interpreters were in the territory, whether con congregate living existed, which local support service advocacy entities existed, whether auxiliary aids existed in the territory, and what devices and equipment were present as events unfolded during disaster response that were rumors that need to be verified regarding people with disabilities who lack services and were unsafe. Rumors were verified people who were transitioned to appropriate temporary shelters. CAG members now serve in the EOC to help facilitate information and develop courses of action to meet the needs of citizens with disabilities and those of older individuals. And right now, the state of New York with Governor Cuomo, he is feeling miserable. He's putting people who he is putting COVID patients with perfectly healthy people who have disabilities or in um or they are in um nursing homes who are elderly and he's killing the population of New York off easily with COVID nineteen patients. Um it's sad to see New York and everybody's praising him. I do not know why, but I've seen I've heard stories about people in nursing homes who are who are being who have COVID nineteen patients being transferred and they have and it's all documented that they knew about that they had COVID nineteen and transferred them anyway, regardless of people's health. So it's stuff which people don't hear. And it's sad to see see um, how mainstream is going on is is supporting a person who is killing people. Um the thing I don't like about MS, I do not like MSM at all. I do not like anybody who's pro anything. Uh, I just wa I just want people to have, and that's the thing about community involvement. The emergency rapid response team is all about community involvement, and people don't understand what's going on. And I tell you what's going on. But every but a sad thing what's going on. We're we're in a sad shape right now, um, and people are praising and people are praising Democrat governors who are who are arresting citizens, and all because they broke their quote unquote quarantine. Which I, I, I and I do see some legitimate arrests, which yes, a lot of them. A lot of them do assault people. Um, some of them do verbal assault and bullying, bullying. But in the long run, you have a normal everyday demonstrator, and they say um, the first uh, some yeah Democrat governor from I think it was Virginia was said um, no it was North Carolina governor from North Carolina. He said that. Um, that protesting is a non essential activity. Um, Governor of North Carolina, newsflash. Protesting against you, especially you, the governor of North Carolina, is an essential activity and you need to be removed from office. Just resign now. Mm -hmm. I Sorry about that. I hate talking politics, but stuff like that. Um, it's all about politics, which can divide a nation easily, and how they do things. Because the emergency rapid response team has taken oath to protect and defend the United States Constitution, both foreign and domestic. So remember that, state of North Carolina. You got you. Yeah, Hawaii has arrested someone for taking a picture of them on the beach with a surfboard. Um, Yeah, and they're supposed to be quarantined on um, one with that beach on the resort property. If it was, they were quarantining themselves. You can't like people in rooms. It's the worst than being in prison. Um, people ha people need to communicate. People need to go outside. People need to breathe the fresh air. Yeah, as long as they're away from people, they are quarantined themselves. Um, Step why you screwed up on that. Um, so remember, community involvement, it, 
you've got to listen to everybody in the community. You cannot just lock people away and think that this is going to be over. This, see, this COVID-19 um, is going to be around for a long time. It's not going to go away. We're, we're going to, our, see, not, when it comes down to viruses, they adapt to us. And right now it's killing us, but in the next few years, it could actually be helpful. It would just be another virus in our system. And we have t tons of viruses in our system. We have tons of bacteria in our system. So I'm, I'm one who is actually not worried about C19. I'm more worried about if people who don't get it, um, and especially with our next generation of children, um, if they get, if, the, if we don't get, if the, if the parents don't get, and they get, get, it could be deadly too. So we just got to adapt to this virus. Like all other viruses, we got to adapt to it. We have viruses in our system all the time. But which ones can we survive and which ones we can't? Like stuff with H1N1, um, Ebola. Ebola, we... Our bodies actually adapted to Ebola. That's why we didn't have a huge outbreak of Ebola. Ebola, Ebola is a very deadly virus, but once it's adapted to us, and once we adapt to, or we adapt to the virus, whatever way it is, I think it's more likely the virus adapts to us. That way, it survives, and we survive. Um, we'll have much healthier lives. We just can't quarantine ourselves. If we get it, we get it. I actually think I, it, 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 during December, I got majorly sick, more sicker than usual, especially during flu season. I was, ugh. Um, and I survived. And after hearing about COVID-19, I more than likely had it and never knew it. So we adapt. And the best thing is, when it comes down to us smokers, because COVID-19 attacks the hemoglobin, um, if people are smokers, nic nicotine coats the blood, red blood cells, and it's hard for COVID-19 to affect those who are smokers. So smoking can actually save your life sometimes. So other than that, just remember community involvement. Private sector, private sector organizations engage in incident response through their own internal response and continuity actions, the commodities they provide, their partnerships with each level of government and their roles within the supply chain. Elements of the private sector are most often the providers of community lifeline services and have a key interest in the stabilization and restoration of their own operations and those of their infrastructure systems. The private sector comprised of a small, medium, and large businesses spans nationally significant infrastructure to locally owned and operated businesses that, with, while small and staples of the community, the private sector includes commerce, healthcare, private, cultural, and educational institutions in industry, as well as public-private partnerships that have established specifically for emergency management purposes, referred to page 26 of the National Response Framework for Additional Information. Okay, when it comes down to private sector, I do not like private sector because they charge an arm and a leg for a lot of emergency supplies. Uh, they should be donating big time. They, the private sectors need to donate more. Instead, a lot of them charge overtime and whatnot. I've seen it several times. They are private sector can be the biggest waste of money besides the government, especially Department of Transportation, which love overtime. And when it comes down to police and fire, they love their overtime pay. That's why I say half the police force should be volunteer, and half the fire department should be half volunteer. If you have half volunteer, half paid, it will save the department tons of money per year. Um, I say a good. I say depending on how large the department is, 
uh, like NYPD, if you do have paid half volunteer, it would save it would save their department over a billion a at least a billion a year. Um, like Orlando, it would save their police department and fire departments over seven hundred fifty million a year. Uh, LA, a couple billion per year if you do half and half. You've got to do half volunteer, half paid. If you all do half volunteer, half paid. Um, if you all do half paid, half volunteer, you can, you can save yourself a good chunk of money, like $500 million for at least the majority of states, half a million dollars a year. And when it comes down to small towns, when it comes down to small towns, you probably about these t- these towns which have like two police officers. It's towns like those should actually, or I say even in Davenport, Florida, in Davenport, Florida, there are like twelve cops. Um, they when they when they could easily have a hundred hundred under four police squad. With twelve paid and the rest with over eighty-eight volunteers. If you have eighty-eight volunteers, that can save that can save a police department millions of dollars per year. It's called it's called you got to start doing your volunteers again. And when it comes down to volunteers, they all talk about liability and whatnot. Volunteers can pay for their own insurance. They have it. it yeah, they have it paid through from the state. So, it, it can, volunteers can easily be insured. So that can save tons of money. And private sectors, they need to donate more instead of charging more. They, they, yeah. When it comes to five one c three threes, a lot. Of, Power one C three, the special like emergency rapid response team, we can't afford that in our equipment. Give it to us seventy five percent off and we'll be happy to show it off and display your logo. Put your logo on our vehicle. Um we do we do logos for because it costs a lot of money to get um bears on car. It, so we charge like usually two fifty to five hundred bucks depending on how big they want their logo on our vehicle and we'll and we'll make our uh, vehicles look like NASCAR cars with sponsors. So if you want so if you have a corporation which wants to sponsor us, um depending on how big you want your logo, two hundred and fifty to five hundred bucks. And it'll be for the life of the vehicle. Then you could pay another two hundred and fifty or life of your logo because we like keeping our logos nice and fresh so two hundred fifty dollars um probably it, logos usually last for like two or three years so every three years two hundred fifty dollars to five hundred dollars every three years now if you want the hood that's ten that's twenty that's easy twenty five thousand dollars because we do not like having a logo on our hood but hey if you're T Mobile you want your logo on our hood Pay us twenty four thousand dollars, and that's the T-Mobile only. <laughs> Other than that, I don't like private sector at all. They could do a lot more to the five one. They could do a lot more for the five one C threes, and also those who are volunteers. Individual families and households. Individual family and households play an important role in emergency preparedness and response. You can contribute by reducing hazards in and around your home. Preparing an emergency supply kit, a household emergency plan, monitoring emergency communication carefully, volunteering with the established organization. Emergency rapid response team is an established organization we've been established for over 25 years, enrolling in emergency response training courses. Non governmental organizations, non governmental organizations play vital roles at local, state, tribal, territorial, insular area, and federal levels in delivering important services including those associated with response core capabilities identifying sheltering locations ensuring uh, access 
to those facilities and communicating their locations to the whole community, providing emergency co commodities and services such as water, food, shelter assistance with family reunification, clothing and supplies for post-emergency cleanup, support the evacuation, rescue, care, and sheltering of the animals displaced by the incident, um, supporting search and rescue, transportation, logistics services, identifying and supporting the health, mental health, medical, mental health, and behavior health resources of the impacted community, and supporting disaster survivors, identifying augmented needs, and developing individual recovery plans. So now you know what NGOs are for. Just point this right. Anything which is about private sector NGOs and volunteers, we all do our own thing. And we all work for the same goals. Uh, with ERRT, we're a little bit different uh, because we primarily do search and rescue, so we go in as fast as we can, get ourselves done, and spray paint the houses. Mm. One thing I love, baby bell cheese. Then they sell cheese ball. Coated with wax. <laughs> and beyond the show, got your first of a perfect cheese. Some NGOs are officially designated as support elements to natural response capabilities. The American Red Cross is chartered by Congress to provide relief to survivors of disasters and help people pre prevent, prepare, and respond to emergencies and have their CEOs get paid over $175,000 per year. And, and your donation goes into their payroll. I'm sorry to say, I have no, I have, America Red Cross is not a 501c3. We are a real 501c3. None of our executives get paid. None. <laughs> we haven't got, none of us got paid for, 20, for 25 years. We do not do this for money. We do this to help do our model. Chasing storms, saving lives. Then it's like, what, it was like 10 years ago, we became, actually it was, actually it was during uh, the post nightclub shooting when I brought in my disaster therapy dog. A couple of weeks prior to the shooting, we, no, it was, yeah, May, yeah, May 26th, um, we just changed it to saving lives, changing lives, because I just got my um, psychiatric first aid. And I decided to use my service dog as a disaster therapy canine. But I do not, I, I do not like American Red Cross. Never have, never will. Um, they are, they are in it for the money. They are not in it to help people. Because I've heard horror stories about American Red Cross throughout the years, especially to our military. Um, during World War II, they were charging for donuts and coffee. Well, other well, there were other organizations where you gave me their coffee and donuts for free. Um, they they are always in for profit. They even even their um even their even their um first aid. You have to as a volunteer, you have to pay five hundred dollars for C, for CPR first aid tr training. To become an instructor, it's like 500 bucks, and then not only that, you have to do it at American Red Cross, and you do not charge them. The money which goes into their course does not go to the instructor; it goes to American Red Cross. So, in other words, the instructors get screwed. Um, it's a lose-lose situation. The only people to actually be instructors for American Red Cross is if you have money. And if you and usually the people who are instructors are also paid employees of the American Red Cross, so basically they get it for and they kind of get it for free because of that. So 
as a volunteer in the American Red Cross, it's the worst thing possible to become an instructor because you always have to pay out of pocket. And I've heard horror stories about that too. Um, so, as a volunteer, it's probably one of the worst places to volunteer. Team Rubicon is now becoming bigger than American Red Cross, and they're like us. They're, we're both we're both veteran organ. We are both veteran by one C three organization. I'm more of a public safety organization now. I switched from disaster response to public safety organization. Uh, Team Rubicon, they're now disaster response. They were disaster relief. They're now they're disaster. They're also disaster recovery, and they do a lot more than we do now. Um, they also they build houses, but I learned a lot from Team Rubicon. They are an awesome organization. I respect them a lot more than American Red Cross. Um, I do not respect Salvation Army when it comes down to that too. If you if you want to know the two, there's only two good organizations. That's the Mercy Rapid Response Team, which has been out for 25 years, and Team Rubicon, which has been out for 10 years. So that said, you know who to, you know who to turn to, either Team Rubicon or Mercy Rapid Response Team. <laughs> this is something new. The National Volunteer Organization Act of in Disaster. The National VOYAD is an associated organization that may engage in how beats the impact of disasters, provides a forum promoting cooperation, communication, coordination, and collaboration, and fosters more effective delivery of services to communities affected by disasters. That is a consortium of over 70 national organizations in 56 territorial state. Equivalence. So one thing I have to do, I have to get into that. Avoid, well, yeah, that is something completely new. Um, so we have we haven't fully committed to it yet, but we are in national. But we are in national five one three three. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and CFC. This is one organization I actually like. You have to have paid. I'm going to have to say this. When it comes down to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, they have to have. They're paid employees more so than the American Cross. Reason why? You have investigators that cost money to find missing children, and lots of it too. I can tell you this: I go through about hundred twenty dollars every week to go to go throughout Central Florida looking for Amber and also missing children. I always keep my eye out looking for them, uh, but. When it comes down to that, they are the only ones who should be legitimately be paid, not the American Red Cross. Sorry, American Red Cross, you don't deserve that hundred thirty-five thousand CEO position. You, you cannot have CEOs which are paid that high, because that deflects the whole entire purpose of putting in money into the community. That de that defeats the purposes of being a five one D three. That defeats the purpose of being a volunteer group. Within the, within the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, the National Emergency Child Low Care Center facilitates the expeditions, identification of children, and their reunification with their families. So I'll select the link to review the volunteer donations may have been support annex. But I'm going to say this. If, say this. When it comes down to C, always look for organization and look for their CEO pay. If their CEO pay is over a hundred thousand dollars per year, don't donate to them. They don't deserve it because it's because they're already getting money from Congress and and the federal government and probably the state to to help pay for their CEO pay and whatnot. Your donation, you know, it was like what? Last time I read, they only had like 10 cents for every dollar for every disaster clientele they had. And it's the same thing with, with Salvation Army, too. It's 10, cents to, for, 10 cents actually goes to the person in need for every dollar donated. So the rest goes to either advertising, marketing, and also their um, executive pay. When it comes out to, if you see executive, if you see 10 cents per dollar per disaster client, that's the one you do not want to do. And that's America Cross. And that is um, 
and that is also um, Salvation Army. So give your heads up on that. This section is now supported by Ooch's Cheese Balls. Ooch! Cheese Balls, what every disaster volunteer needs. While well, getting stressed out by re even thinking about executive pay by these so called 501c3s. Critical infrastructure, such as utilities and hospitals, are partners' responsibility. Private sector, local government, state government, federal government. When it comes down to critical infrastructure such as utilities and hospitals, it is the responsibility of the private sector because utilities and hospitals are private sector. Correct. How do individuals and families play an important role in emergency preparedness? Reduce hazards around the house Watch the news and follow social media, prepare emergency for supply kits, and volunteer with the established organization. It's all the above. Uh oh. Watching the news and follow social media is not part of, not an important role in emergency management. But here's the thing. It actually can, watching the news and following social media can play a vital role in emergency management because the people who are on social media are emergency management groups. Like you have the different EOCs, you have the different counties in emergency management, you have the state emergency management on social media, and they're always on the news. So watching the watching the news and following social media can play a crucial role, in knowing what can actually happen. Kind of a crucial question, especially in today's age. If it is just watch the news, yeah, that's not an important role. But following social media would be an important role because you can actually contact your friends, family, even the county, saying, "I'm looking. I'm seeing this at a different angle." So following social media, how they have it, following social media uh, actually can play an important and vital role in emergency, managed, emergency preparedness. I'm going to contact FEMA and ask them exactly why they didn't follow social media because following social media, this does not mean just follow if you're also communicating with social media too. So watching the news can actually play a, an important role in emergency preparedness because you're helping out the community. Local government, the responsibility for responding to natural and human caused incidents that have recognizable geographic boundaries generally begin at the local event. Local police, fire, emergency, medical services, public health, and medical providers, emergency management, public works, environmental response professionals, and other local responders are often the first to detect a threat or hazard or respond to an incident and frequently they are the last to leave an incident site. And usually, an ERT is usually the last to leave. Local governments bear to the vast majority of incidents that occur each day. Local key players include, click on each photo to see the key player roles and responsibilities. Chief elected or appointed official.
Director Joe, chief executives are responsible for the public safety and welfare of the people of their jurisdiction. Officials provide strategic guidance and resources across all five mission areas. Chief elected or appointed officials must have a clear understanding of their emergency management roles. Air responsibilities are how to apply the response core capabilities because they need because they may need to take make decisions regarding resources and operations during an incident to stabilize community lifelines. Lives may depend on their decisions. Elected and appointed officials also routinely shape and modify laws, policies, and budgets to aid preparedness and improve emergency management and response capabilities. The local chief executive's responses may include the following, obtaining assistance from the other governmental agencies, providing direction for response activities, and ensuring appropriate information is provided to the public. Okay, people, I have to do, I, I got to, I'm, I'm going to take a quick, Break. I'm not sure how long it's going to take, but as you can notice, if you saw what I saw um, with this, the chief elected official, I have to contact FEMA. They have some typos. Okay. Hey, it's day of May. <laughs> oh, come on, FEMA. You, you can do better than that. So now you have the emergency manager. The jurisdiction emergency manager oversees the day-to-day -day emergency management programs activities. The emergency manager works with chief select 
elected and appointed officials to establish unified objectives regarding the jurisdictions, emergency plans, and activities. The, this role is entails coordinating and integrating all elements of the community. The emergency manager coordinates the local emergency management program. This includes assessing the capacity and readiness to deliver the capabilities most likely required to stabilize community lifelines during an incident and identifying and correcting shortfalls. The local emergency manager's duties often include the following, advising elected and appointed officials during response, conducting response operations in accordance with the National Emergency Management System, coordinating the function of local agencies, coordinating the development of plans, and working co cooperatively with other local agencies, community organizations, private sector businesses, and NGOs. Developing and maintaining mutual aid and assistance agreements, coordinating resource requests during an incident through the management of an emergency operations center, coordinating damage assessments during an incident, advising and informing local officials and the public about emergency management activities during an incident to facilitate response operations such as sheltering, avoiding evacuating, and resupply of food and water, developing and executing accessible public awareness and education programs, conducting exercises to rehearse response activities, test personnel, plans, and systems, and apply areas for improvement. Coordinating integration of individuals with disabilities. Individuals from racially and ethnically diverse backgrounds and others with access and functional needs into emergency planning and response and helping to ensure the continuation of essential services and functions through the development and implementation of continuity of operation plans. Departments and agency heads. Local government department and agency heads collaborate with the emergency manager during development of local emergency plans and provide key response resources. Participation in the planning process helps ensure that state specific capabilities are integrated into a workable plan to safeguard the community, the department and agency heads, and their staff develop, plan, and train on internal policies and procedures to meet response needs safely. And they participate in interagency training and exercise to develop and maintain necessary capabilities. State, tribal, territorial, and insular area governments. State, tribal, territorial, and insular governments are responsible for the health and welfare of their residents, community, lands, and cultural heritage. So remember, state, tribal, territorial, and insular area governments are responsible for the health and welfare of their residents, communities, lands, and cultural heritage. I really did not like how FEMA does this racial and cultural profiling. When um, a long time ago, I had an ancestor which said, which is right on the federal, which is on the federal court in um, Washington, D.C. is a federal courthouse. Um, it was stated there is only one race, the superior race, the human race. You got to start speaking about human, about us being human. Race, culture, none of that applies to the United States anymore. Um, we are the human race. We are a diverse race. We are so diverse that we are the mixing bowl of the world. No country is like the United States. We have everybody from every single country living here. And 
we got to start thinking of ourselves as human. I had, I had the um, census. I wrote on the census. Every question was illegal. Um, basically, what they want to do is keep segregation alive and well in the federal government. I, you, you, anybody who's disabled should have that right. Anybody who's from a different race should already have that right. There's only one race, a superior race, a human race. Every single building should be made disability accessible already. It just frustrates me that we as humans are are segregating ourselves in a sense this actually shows it. And I did not answer any of the questions. I just wrote there are two people who live here. That's it. Take her let leave it. I mean it. Everybody is human. Everybody be, should be treated like a disabled person already because they should have everything disabled, disability accessible already. Um, it's just some of these questions, some of these things which they bring out on FEMA is totally uncalled for. I like I like the FEMA test and everything, but it's uncalled for as long as people start thinking of themselves as humans. I don't see this way this way when it comes down to gender. I see just using the word gender as a hate crime now because guess what? You're you're trying you're you're trying to exclude people. It, when it comes down to exclu there's exclu there's inclusion and exclusion. And it seems like the federal government everywhere they turn are trying to exclude more and more people. As you know, some of these questions were racial based. And hello, there's only one race, the superior race, the human race. If we don't start seeing ourselves as humans, we we are a failure as a nation, as a world leader, a failure in that. We got to start saying what race, the human race. So state governments, when incidents expands or has potential to expand beyond the capability of local jurisdiction responders, cannot meet the needs with mutual aid and assistant resources. Local officials contact the state. State governments supplement the local efforts by applying state and resources first. If additional resources are required, states can request assistance from other states through interstate mutual aid and assistance agreements, such as the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, the MSC. If a state anticipates that resources may be exceeded, the governor may, be, may request assistance from the federal government through a Stafford Act declaration. EMAC, the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, administered by National Emergency Management Association Interstate Mutual Aid Agreement, a way to streamline the interstate mutual aid and assistance program. Check this link for the IMAC website. Uh, states support their local governments, which are clo closest to the those impacted by incidents. State government key players include the governor, the director of state emergency management agency, state, state homeland security advisor, and national guard. I, I right now we are in a time lapse. Um, it's been it's been over an hour, and I've only done like ten pages. So I'm gonna go by fast. Tribal government. The United States has a trusted relationship with federally recognized Indian tribes and recognized tribes as the sovereign nations. Under Chapter Act, federally recognized Indian tribes can directly request their own emergency declaration and major declaration, or they can request assistance under a state request. Chief Executive is responsible for public safety and welfare coordination resources needed to respond to incidents of all types, make amends, or suspend certain orders or regulations associated with the response in accordance with law. Communicates with public in accessible manner and help people, businesses, or organizations cope with the consequences of any type of incident, negotiates mutual aid, and assists agreements with other local jurisdictions, state, tribal, 
in Australia government and request federal assistance like this week for tribal coordination support. It. Okay, under Hurricane Sandy, um, Sandy actually was the one which let basically made um, Indian tribes request their own emergency declaration dur er dur during Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy, they had a huge problem with the tribal nations. Um, so they did this on a staff for fact, federally recognized Indian tribes could request their own emergency declaration. And the key word is battery recognized. If a tribe is not federally recognized, they don't get assistance, pure and simple. And just for this way, you gotta be you gotta be in a federally recognized tribe to even declare yourself like, okay, I'm a Apache tribe. Or I'm a Cherokee tribe. Tribe, you gotta be, you got, you gotta be declared by that tribe that you are a federally recognized Indian tribe to be declared a Native American. Territory and insular area governments. Territory and insular area governments are responsible for coordinating resources to address actual or potential incidents and have many of the same functions states have as previously listed in the section. Because of their remote locations, territorial and insular area governments often face unique challenges in receiving assistance from outside the jurisdiction quickly and often because of assistance from neighboring islands other nearby countries, states, and the private sector or NGO resources. What are the federal government? Definitely there are language and cultural differences that must be considered as well as potential for authorities that overlap with federal authorities. When it comes down to language and cultural differences, yes, territorial and territorial area governments will have that problem. Puerto Rico you will not see that problem that much because almost I know a lot of Puerto Ricans, especially when I visited Puerto Rico, they all can speak English. We have Puerto Rico. If you speak, a lot of them, a lot of them actually had a basic concept of English, but you spoke slowly and clearly, they could understand your English and know what you're saying. I love going to U.S. territories the most because basically you're still in the United States, but um, but you're in a whole different world. You 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 don't see that territory like the United States. You I never want to see the territories as a state at all, like Puerto Rico. It would be great as a state, but it would be gerrymandered. There would be gerrymandering in Puerto Rico to make everything look like the United States when it shouldn't. You'll lose that culture. Hawaii, you lost it. Hawaii, I already see our skyscrapers now. Used to be a beautiful country. Used to be a beautiful state a long time ago, but now you, now, now you have this gerrymandering. And you have a Walmart now, it had, it was intense. It had a parking garage, and with that parking garage, they had carts going up the escalator. <laughs> they had an oh no escalator, car escalator to take the car with you. It felt like I was still in the States.
there are too much gerrymandering going on with when a state when you have a country we have a territory turned to a state. It loses that culture. And yes, languages can be a problem, but it can be overcome because everybody does have basic English. Federal government. Federal government takes a wide range of capabilities and resources that may be required to deal with domestic incidents. In order to save lives and protect property and environment while ensuring the protection of privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties, federal government becomes involved with the response within, when federal interests are involved, when state, local, tribal, or territorial governments are requested assistance or authorized required by statute or regulation or policy. Types of federal aid, federal response and assistance available without staff for active creation. National response paper covers the full responsibility of complex and constantly changing requirements in anticipation or response or in response to threats or actual incidents. In addition to, to staff support, the national response framework or other supplementary or co complementary operational plans may be applied to respond or provide other forms of support. Media life saving assistance to states and other types of assistance, such as wildland fire fighting support or response to an agricultural disease or cybersecurity incident, are performed by federal department or agencies under their own authorities or in funding through reciprocal mutual assistance agreements. Federal to federal support, a federal department or agency responding to an incident under its own authorities may also request support from the Secretary of Homeland Security. And obtain and coordinate additional federal assistance. Federal departments and agencies may execute interagency or interagency reimbursable agreements in accordance with the Economy Act and other applicable authorities. Federal support to states, tribal nations, territories, and insular areas and local jurisdictions that take many forms, the most widely known under which assistance is provided for major incidents is the Stafford Act. So requesting federal assistance.
which agency responds to an incident where it has potential to expand beyond the capability of local jurisdiction? Okay. Gotta remember the tears when it comes down to this question. Potential response to an instant where it has potential to expand the yeah, capability of local jurisdiction. Right now, it's at the local government. So, the answer is state government. Correct. Because remember, it's local, it's local, then it's tribal, and then it's state, and then it's federal. Easy to remember. Remember, local, state, local, tribal, state, territorial, and then federal. So just remember the tiers. Because without you remembering, memorizing those tiers, you'll never get this answer right. So remember, once it expands beyond the capability of local jurisdiction, that's state government. Okay, so that's what I mean. In this lesson, you learned how the national response framework defines the response roles and capabilities of all elements, the whole community. The next lesson prevents the core capabilities of the response mission area and the actions required to build and deliver these capabilities. Okay, I'm going to shut down the live stream and we'll come to being class at 7.45, 10 minute break. And, th and thank you for all coming to this session. Um, subscri subscribe, like, and tell your, fi and tell your family, fr your friends, your family about this channel that you have this crazy Sartek who's teaching this course. <laughs> But, you know what? Sartex, you gotta be nuts to be a Sartex, but one thing I would love to see, um, when it came down, to, when they were talking about wildland fires, I would like to see the U.S. Forestry to open up their doors to volunteer fire for wildland firefighters, because you need more of them every year. Um, other than that, I want to stop streaming, and we'll be back at 6.45. We'll take a quick 10-minute break. <laughs>